<laughs> wow. <laughs> and it was needed and and important. And though you are honest, and there's something about your honesty, I've seen it bring light and bring. You know, I saw you say to Nick once, "This is really great, my son Nick. This is really great, but your drum tracks need to be beefed up." And you left, and he was like, "Ah, he's right." And nobody wants to hear that. And the tendency is for most people in the world to go, "I don't know if I should say this or not." One of the things I love most about you is you you say it. And but you're right. Your discernment is good. You're you're accurate. Well, you know, as behind the scenes players in 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 what we do, number one, you you want to you want to keep the job. You want to keep working with the artists. You want to keep working with the record company. So you know, oftentimes you might be intimidated to say when asked, you know, what do you think, and and you might not want to say it because of things like tactfulness or timing or whatever. Um, and it's, you know, it's gotten me in trouble quite a lot throughout my life. I've been, I'm probably as many great positions as I've held and success that I've been lucky enough to have, I've been fired. And um, sometimes people don't want to hear it. Uh, and, yeah. the, and, and the result is adios. So uh, maybe I'm the most fired uh, <laughs> person in the history of the music business. I might be. Um but but that did that sometimes it that leads didn't to a hit. affect anything you know well, what? i'll tell you a story it's very timely right now we're just doing the t uh, experiencing the 20th anniversary of christina aguilera's what was her fourth album but considered her second album stripped right and, and an artist well known for having very strong opinions herself well we at that time because i knew christina so well i had taken the position of standing behind her vision and seeing the world through her eyes but also trying to elevate whatever it was she was on about uh, without placing judgment on it. It didn't have to be my way or it was always her way. But but on, when it came to the song Beautiful, um, Linda Perry produced it and wrote it. And, you know, you could say in some respects that it was Linda's movie. She was directing the movie, but Christina starred in the movie. Yeah. And there was a, we got into a little bit of an argument about the piano part on on Beautiful. And uh, Linda was very upset with me. And I, sa I said something like, you know, I think you could do it better. And um, she got upset with me. And, and then I suggested, still thinking of a way to get that piano part better. Mm -hmm. I suggested that uh, we get Elton to play the piano on Beautiful. Thinking wow. like, you know, as a guy playing cards, like, okay, queen, king, ace. Elton. Yeah, exactly. And where, so that made Linda even angrier because I was trying to up the ante. And um, of course, Elton and Christina on that song, they might've even done it somewhere on one of the TV shows, but it would have been, would have been great. But um, I, I left, I, I may have been asked to leave. I don't really remember, it was 20 years ago, but the point is Linda replayed the piano for herself. <laughs> and really elevated it wow. and and solved the problem uh her way which is how she should how problems in the studio should be solved by the artist and by the musicians not by the overseer at the same time i make my own records and sometimes people make suggestions to me that i don't like but they 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 uh they spur on further thought about the assembly of the creative elements and the musical elements and you know, it's like a prism. You look at it from every angle mm -hmm. and then make a decision. But in the case of Beautiful, uh, regardless of the genesis, she replayed the piano. It's a gorgeous record. It's a forever record. Um, it's an incredible piece of, of all of our lives now. And as wonderful as that record is, it's better because you spoke your mind. It was great. So, uh, that was a Baz Luhrmann saw me. Well, first of all, I was the link to Christina and we borrowed her. I had just left RCA and became president of AM under Jimmy Ivy. But he saw me as a kind of necessary glue 
because Missy Elliott was the overseer. It was he wanted Missy's flavor, mm. and he and and Missy brought in Rockwilder to do the beat, and yet coordinating four different artists and different artist schedules and getting you know four very different artists between um, Christina Pink Maya and Little Kim. Uh, that there was a lot of moving parts to that. And so I think Baz saw me as a guy who could come in the team and st help stitch it together. And so I ended up recording the vocals, but they didn't record together. They, um, and producing the vocals, they, they recorded uh, at different times and each brought incredible energy to it in their own way. And it was, it was the first time I, I didn't know how to do the ad libs. Um, on an R&B record where you have four different vocalists that all need to take ad libs right. singing over, over the backgrounds and over the progression. So I just, because um, if you remember your, uh, your music theory on, uh, on Lady Marmalade, it's a mode. Da, 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 da. Over and over again. Da, 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 da. So an, an R&B ad lib is, is kind of in that tonality yeah, Ooh, woo. whatever whatever the lick is, it's all gonna go over. Da 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 da. da. So it doesn't really dun, matter dun, if it's dun. before the chorus, in the middle of the verse. It's just I just need the lick, and I wanted it to be inspired. I didn't want to have to like make one up. Yeah, yeah, and, and like then aim it and and then give that constraint to the singer who's supposed to be vibing. Like you have to do it this way in this spot. So it's like, just sing ad libs all the way down the record from start to finish. Don't even worry about what's going on underneath. So it's a three and a half minute track going da 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 da. Perfect for R&B, right? Right. Except for, except for the bridge. So don't worry about the bridge. So each Christina Pink, Maya, little, even little Kim, they all just gave off the top of their head ad libs. And if one of them was good, one of them happened to be good, I would say on talk, I do that one again, do that one again, listen to it real quick and do it again. So they were based on improvs. So it was all inspiration and wow. very little perspiration. And then I took the, I, so I had maybe 50 or 60 ad libs of each singer, including the rap ones. Right. And I put them all onto two different keyboards, sampled them and truncated them so that I knew one, two, three, four. If I hit it on four, it would come in in the pocket where it was supposed to be. Everybody was truncated to beat four. So wow. I'm triggering them by hand. And then I named them all. I learned every single ad lib. I learned them by name, up swoop, back door, <sighs> next day. Like I just gave them names and I knew next day was, yeah, whatever it was. And I played all the ad libs in and created a counterpoint on the record, which then they learned and were able to do it live. And it all made perfect sense as if they sung it that way naturally. But I got the best ad libs, most off, you know, most inspired off the top of their head. And, um, and so Lady Marmalade also has, a, everybody was a hero. Christina hit the gigantic high G yeah. and open chest voice. Pink came in with that salty tone. Yeah. She was like, like, you know, like lower range Joplin. Uh, little Kim had the flavor, the street thing. Mm -hmm. But Maya, who was kind of the unsung hero, Maya had the pocket. So all of the all of the all of the backgrounds, hey sister souls, all the feel of it was all Maya to begin with, and everybody jumped on Maya's groove and, and listened to Maya while they sang. Wow, so what a combination! Played, yeah, and then they went on. The, the thing went to number one about about five weeks after we finished it. The album was a giant smash. They won the Grammy for vocal collaboration. They performed it on the Grammys. Patti LaBelle came out of the state out of the you know, from out of, from an elevator. Um, so yeah, like you say, uh, the name of the podcast is what? I um, lived it. Legendary. I so, lived it. So, you know, there, there I was for, um, for that. And on Grammy night, of course, th this is really funny because, you know, while we're doing the deep dive as musos, if you bought a brand new Korg Triton at the time of Lady Marmalade, which was a, the dope keyboard of the day. Mm -hmm. if you happen to buy that, um, and you start and you press on the very first sound that comes on. Bank A sound zero 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 is called noisy stabber. So you're going through the library of sounds. So you get your brand new keyboard out of the box, turn it on. 
noisy stabber. And that is the exact patch that's going. It was like Rock Wilder got his new keyboard. I don't know how to stop that beeping, unfortunately. It's just part of it. I've, I've, I don't know if you're getting it, but it's like Rock Wilder uh, bought a new keyboard, turned it on, hit the first thing that was on, and there it was. And went, wow, this would be a great and track. It was a number wow, one. Wow, wow, that's wow, the whole wow. track. That's the whole track. <laughs> is the noise he played stuff. that? Obviously, it's the first thing you see. <laughs> yeah. So when we did, when we played it on the Grammys, I took it upon myself to play that part live. We had a live uh, horn section, and uh, the guy drumming that night was Abraham Laboriel, who's we all know as McCartney's drummer now. But absolute, what a great family! Right. But yeah, what yeah, a great so, guy. And Alex Al, who was Michael Jackson's bass player. Yep. Hey, um, he was the I've been with that. him too. That's it's amazing. <laughs> so uh, that was full circle. It came both of those records. Wow. Be without you and well, all of them beautiful and Lady Marmalade. They they came full circle. Rarefied moments, you know, and and uh, have to be appreciative for what they are. Oh, absolutely. Well, you mentioned Jimmy Iovine, and mm -hmm. of course, I've had some encounters with him, but not like you. How did you end up working with Jimmy? Because a lot of people know him. Do you know the they story? Think, or, they think, or are you just asking? I, I, well, I I know the story. Okay, because it's there's a good. There's a world of people that may not know the story, and it's one of my favorite stories of all time. But, well, but a lot of people know him from American Idol now yeah, and don't really or, realize or what a giant he is yeah, and yeah, what yeah. a great guy he is. So I would love for the world to know how you teamed up with Jimmy Iovine. Okay, well, I'll tell you. So so there's a few uh, permutations to it, and I'll, so I'll say the somewhat more politically correct version of it. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, um, when Christina got, Genie in a Bottle blew up, I signed Christina, and, oversaw her first five albums yeah when she blew up she got the cover of rolling stone which is kind of the holy grail of stardom yeah she's on the cover and in the interview they ask her you know well, how did genie and bottle come about and she says something to the effect of well my perfectionistic totalitarian mean a and r guy ron fair forced me to sing genie in a bottle that so had to feel really had, good but at that point in time, you know, Christina, it, 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 for whatever reason, she said that she may have felt that or, or she may have been transferring frustration on me. I don't know. But it, I had always total amnesty and forgiveness for her. She was basically like 17 years old and mm -hmm. on the cover of Rolling Stone. So, so OK, if you want to say I forced you to sing Genie in a Bottle, OK, what am I going to do? I didn't take it personally. It didn't break my heart. Other things did, but not that. Yeah. Um, and uh so now fast forward the uh rolling stone is out i'm in winnipeg the mosquito capital of the world with where mosquitoes fly around like like seagulls they're they're massive in, yes. in, in the summer <laughs> and we're in the studio i was on the road with her recording my kind of christmas her christmas album which is in later years has become very acclaimed mm -hmm. and um and I was in the middle of like doing ooze on Oh Holy Night or something like that because we, I went on the road with her and recorded all the vocals while she was on tour because we didn't have time to stop and do a Christmas record. And um, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm sitting there doing like literally like vocal retakes. Okay, next note, ooh, here we go, two, three, four, ooh, and the phone rings. And it's the receptionist at the front of the studio saying, Ron, there's a phone call for you. Jimmy Iovine's calling for you. So I, of course, was like, what? I, I don't really know Jimmy Iovine. Like, why would he be calling for me? He's like, Christina, give me a second. I got to take this call. I thought it was Danny Strick pranking me because he used to call up and say, it's Clive Davis. It's Walt Dietrichov. It's Jimmy Iovine. Like, he used to do that all the time. I can believe that with Danny. <laughs> so I think it's him pranking me. And I, so I start off by saying, look, I'm right in the middle of cutting ooze on Oh Holy Night, you know. And it was like, hey, Ron, it's Jimmy Ivey. <laughs> really? He goes, yeah, look, uh, you got a minute? I got Rolling Stone right here. It says in the magazine, you forced Christina Aguilera to sing Genie in a Bottle. Is that true? I didn't know what, what to say. I, I thought it was, I, I just didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to answer that question. So I was like, uh, uh, and he goes, well, if you could force her to sing 
a number one record like Genie in a Bottle, can you come and work for me and force all my artists to sing number ones? <laughs> oh, I love that story so much. That's amazing. Unfair it is to be a female artist mm. as opposed to a male and be judged by things like the clothes you wear, the lip liner, the eye makeup, the tightness of uh, of the fit. But in but with females in pop, all of those things do come into it. And I was a guy who was a music guy and following the music impulses and the other pieces of the puzzle that would have maybe helped us get through some of the some of the hurdles mm-hmm. weren't there. They weren't there on the label part and they weren't there on the management part. So ultimately it did not work. But musically it worked. Although we didn't have a hit, all the lessons were learned so that when I met the very young Christina Aguilera, everything that I had been trying striving for with Wild Orchid was transferred to Christina and it worked as a solo singer with background parts. But it was R it was it was white chick R and B and it was very, very strong. <clears throat> but um so Wild Orchid uh, fired me off off their record and um I went on to uh to work on Christina and then ultimately left and joined up with Jimmy. Um, But you're there now. What are the projects that you're working on? You know, I know, you know, you, you cover from classical to country to Christmas, I mean, and pop and beyond. Yeah. I don't have a Christmas record this year, which I'm I'm a little bummed out about, but I've, I've had uh, my Christmas playlist is like 150 songs now. Amazing. Um, Christina, the OJs, Fantasia, John Pizzarelli, Darren Chris, Adina Menzel, Runaway June. Yep. Laney Wilson. Amazing. So, Amazing. Yeah, we did Laney Wilson's Christmas record uh two years ago. 